Okay, so now uh, uh, it's the, the first keynote speaker is Paul Stoy from University of Wisconsin Medicine. He'll be talking about partitioning eddy covariance measured evapotranspiration into transpiration and evaporation. Uh, so, if Paul, uh, I can hand this over to you. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Thanks for the introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'll be talking, as mentioned, mostly about the challenges and opportunities of partitioning uh, transpiration and evaporation from evapotranspiration measurements. The funding for this study, I'll be presenting data that's funded by NSF, the United States Department of Agriculture and the University of Wisconsin. Data will be coming from Fluxnet, the NACP site level interim synthesis, and the Cheesehead 19 project, Ankur Desai's the PI. And a lot of this work will be um, Victoria Schweitzer's uh, graduate work here at the University of Wisconsin. A lot of these ideas are hers. She's doing a great job. Uh, Ankur, Brian Butterworth, many others that are part of the Cheesehead 19 project uh, were critical for collecting these data. And thanks again for the invitation. It's an honor to be here. I wanted to start out, there is so much to talk about with evaporation and transpiration. Um, I'm gonna talk first about a little bit of evapotranspiration in the news. Uh, on Ameriflux website right now, there's a very nice blog post by Dennis Baldocki about the important topic of trends in evaporation. And I also wanna point out that I'll be saying transpiration, but transpiration is still evaporation, just through the stomata. And Diego Morales has a very nice paper about this uh, terminology just from a couple of years ago. So um, there's more plant water uptake in the news just in last week's nature, spatio-temporal origin of soil water uptake by vegetation by Miguez Macho and Fan uh, discussed how most soil water uptake by plants comes from precipitation that fell about a month, up to a month ago, almost 20% on average globally came from deeper soil sources from local precipitation that fell. Prior to that, uh, only about 1% of global evapotranspiration comes from directly from groundwater and 10% is from upland infiltration that flowed downhill. So as we're learning more and more about the water cycle, I'm sure some of these numbers will change. There's important regional differences, but we're continuously learning more about one of the most important cycles in our Earth system, the water cycle. So we have you know, evaporation from water bodies, what we often call evapotranspiration, still a type of, eva of evaporation from um, terrestrial surfaces, and then also sublimation, which tends to be a little bit excluded, but can be up to 50% of wintertime uh, precipitation, especially in wintry and very windy, short statured vegetation sites. So there's so much still to learn about our changing water cycle. And we still have a lot to learn about the processes that control these fluxes. So we here at this community, we tend to be right at ecovariance type people. We tend to think at the ecosystem scale. We try to scale globally. Uh, we do our best, right? So we're measuring precipitation, perhaps using tip tipping buckets or rain gauges. There's also stem flow to think about and plant through fall. There's transpiration that we can measure using sap flow or other types of approaches. We have eddy variance to measure the combination of transpiration and evaporation that comes not just from the soil, but also the canopy via interception. Um, and then once that water may or may not go into the soil, it could be stored with a change in storage, or it could flow into groundwater or via overland. And all of those things make up the ecosystem water budget and all of those things are changing, especially right the atmosphere and its composition, which is changing the amount of leaves that are on plants and the responses of stomata to that atmosphere. Right? We have changes in plant water use efficiency occurring globally, and we have changes in atmospheric temperature and also changes in the global radiation balance, energy balance, both from global brightening dimming that are also changing all aspects of the water cycle, which are critical to understand. And there are so many different ways of measuring them. Okay, this is from a paper that we published in Biogeosciences recently in 2019, showing all of the different ways that we can uh, think about or just look at um, transpiration, evaporation, and water cycle, like satellite, airborne, UAV remote sensing. We have radio sounds to make profiles. 
We have eddy covariance, we can study isotopes, we can measure chambers, there's cosmos and cosmic ray methods for measuring soil moisture. We have precipitation tipping buckets, we can measure through fall and sap flow and stem flow, leaf wetness, all of the different places that water can go. And of course, this is quite a lot, right? Lysimeters, water table depth, soil moisture at depth. Okay, these, this is hard. How can we better have, have a better understanding of two of the most important fluxes here, namely transpiration and evaporation, and how can we as the eddy covariance community contribute to our global understanding of these critical processes? I'd really like to point out a fantastic paper by um, Julia Kuhl and others in 2014, uh, where they discuss and review a number of approaches and measurements that you can use to partition evapotranspiration into transpiration and evaporation. So read this paper first. It's a fantastic overview, and there's been a lot of movement in this field, of course, lately over the past uh, few years. And we wrote, of course, this recent synthesis and summary um, a couple years ago that uh, discusses some of the newer approaches. And I wouldn't be surprised if another review is necessary in another few years as people are developing more and more ways of understanding transpiration and evaporation. So. <clears throat> One of the ways I wanted to bring up today was a nice approach by uh, Russ Scott and Joel Biederman in 2017 that's been expanded upon since. And the notion here is that transpiration should have to be linearly related to gross primary productivity, especially at longer time scales like monthly time scales. And when they're using this transpiration of transpiration partitioning approach based on GPP, they get logical results for different types of plant canopies under different times of year here in more dryland ecosystems. And it's important to point out also that um, the transpiration of evapotranspiration ratio is consistently found to be a function of the leaf area index is there's a lot of studies that go into understanding over longer time scales how transpiration, uh, evaporation, and evapotranspiration work and find excellent simplifying mechanisms. And these are all great, but it's also very important to understand the dynamics, the dial course, for example, of the transpiration to evapotranspiration ratio, the T over AT ratio. Uh, and one of the reasons to, for doing that is because models of these fluxes tend to do a relatively poor job because of plant hydrodynamics. What's that, right? The capacitance for trees for water, okay, the diurnal course in uh, stomata closing in response to vapor pressure deficits or other physiological stresses and water stresses. And Ashley Matheny in 2014 wrote an interesting study that uses the NACP site level in term synthesis data set to demonstrate these chronic diurnal uncertainties in multiple different models when confronted with flux data from multiple different sites, right? So we need to have not just a longer term understanding, but I'm gonna also argue as well a shorter term understanding of these processes. And of course, there are a number of partitioning approaches that are taking, that are able to take into account some of these dynamics. Some that are different, but have similar assumptions by Berkelhammer and others in 2016 and Joe et al. Um, 2014, 2016, there have been uh, recent updates on these papers as well, make a few assumptions that we can test. One is that plants do not function optimally in response to increasing vapor pressure deficit. And the second is that at the ecosystem scale, the transpiration to evapotranspiration ratio can approach one. So um, with Berkelhammer, right, they're assuming that evapotranspiration is a function of gross primary productivity times vapor pressure deficit raised to 0.5. And Joe are using this notion that there's an actual and potential underlying water use efficiency, UW, E, which is a function of GPP times vapor pressure deficit raised to 0.5 divided by either transpiration or evapotranspiration. Uh, the latter there being actually observed using any covariance. The other, if it, this ratio can approach one, can be inferred. So we can test these assumptions using flux data and different um, partitioning approaches and note that theory predicts that the GPP to transpiration ratio, if optimal, Right, this will be a function of vapor pressure deficit to the negative 0.5. So if we again assume that the T over ET ratio 
can approach one under certain circumstances, right, we can fit a boundary line analysis, right? As GPP over ET becomes entirely T, that's gonna be the upper limit of that distribution that we see plotted here. This is for one particular FluxNet site. Uh, fit a boundary line analysis and ask what that scaling parameter, in this case, I'm calling it M is. And we find down below that well, perhaps 0.5, right? That optimal approach might be reasonable or perhaps on average it's a little bit less than that, suggesting some aspect perhaps of suboptimality, which also may exist. The second assumption, right, does this T over ET ratio approach one in the first place? Uh, using a partitioning approach I'll describe in a second, we find that over a winter wheat field, this might not be a bad assumption. It will never be one. There's always gonna be some evaporation, even if it's quite trivial, uh, but does it approach one? And our argument might be yes, although in some ecosystems, this might be a better assumption than others. Perez Priego and all uh, in this study on the right showed that it rarely, if ever, does, or perhaps. Um, and on that note, right, there are many, many other, I could only scratch the surface of all of the partitioning approaches um, that are uh, present today and available to use. One is Oscar Perez, Perez Priego's approach, which I'm going to argue is a kind of model data fusion takes a lot of theory, it takes observations, uh, and then it sort of uses those to parse out right, what water use efficiency is, and what transpiration versus evapotranspiration is. And then Jacob Nelson is going to be discussing later today uh, different partitioning approaches, including, I assume, his T approach, which is a machine learning type approach um, that is taking multiple different data sets, right, and plant physiological theory, and coming up with a solution for how much water is entering the atmosphere through plants and how much is not. So all of these approaches so far have used some aspect of theories that we understand of plant physiology, the response of transpiration to vapor pressure deficit. And these are fantastic assumptions that are right, been demonstrated again and again at the leaf scale, at the canopy scale, et cetera. And you can see across, for example, the entire FluxNet database, right? This is a two-dimensional kernel density estimate of the space where evapotranspiration can exist as a function of vapor pressure deficit. And you see that very strong constraint at high levels of DPD, where there just simply aren't any ET observations. Okay, plants close their stomata. We know that. Can we make an independent assumption, right, about turbulence theory and the turbulence that we're actually using to measure fluxes using that equivariance? to directly partition transpiration and evaporation based on what we know about the atmosphere. <clears throat> and the answer right, is that we likely can. And the flux variance similarity approach by Scanlon and Kustas, there's another paper by Scanlon and Sahu in 2008. There are updates to this. There is a Python um, package created by uh, Todd Skaggs called FluxPart that I'm providing for you there, um, makes the assumption that I would argue holds that stomatal and non stomatal fluxes can form independently to flux variance similarity. So what does this mean? Okay, if you have a parcel of air that's interacting with a stomatal surface, every time you have more water vapor, you're going to have less carbon dioxide right, from the average. And then that relationship will be a function of the water use efficiency of that plant. Evaporation, right? Every time you have a parcel there interacting with a surface that is not stomatal, non stomatal, you have respiration, so an increase in CO2 concentration versus this average, as that's the R prime on the y axis of the second figure here. And you have evaporation, so that's a positive value of what they're calling here QM prime, um, or, right, so the water entering the atmosphere and carbon entering the atmosphere as well. And so once you sum up all of those eddies that are interacting with stomatal and non-stomatal surfaces, you get some right, deviance from that perfect transpiration assumption with that certain water use efficiency uh, and actually arrive at an estimate of how much of that water came through plants and how much did not. That's the fundamentals, and there's a lot of mathematics behind this, um, behind flux variance similarity theory, and previously water use efficiency had to be prescribed, it was highly sensitive to that. There's a new paper by Scanlon and all uh, in 2019, are you an effect that you can optimize for that water use efficiency parameter directly, right? Making it, in my view, far more robust. And so we wanted to investigate this approach uh, using flux variance similarity across Anchor Design, now there's Chi said 19 experiment where there's 19 eddy covariance towers 
in a um, dynamic ecosystem in north central Wisconsin, Matthias Bauder might be talking about it next, I'm not sure, uh, where the fundamental question has to do with the um, lack of closure of medical variants, which of course I can't address today, that's a huge and important topic. But over a 10 by 10 kilometer area, there were 19 eddy covariance towers, and we can use these observations to understand perhaps how much water in these different systems were coming through trees and how much was not. So if we look at the transpiration over evapotranspiration ratio on a daily time scale over the measurement period for the three fundamental vegetation types, we have pine forests, deciduous forests, and wetland ecosystems. You see, um, this is in the Northern hemisphere here, right? And the transition from summer to autumn and then almost a little bit winter, we have a lower and lower T over ET ratio over time and a higher and higher evaporation over ET ratio over time as plants begin to lose their leaves. Although the pine forest and deciduous forest seem to be behaving quite similarly, the wetland uh, sites consistently have higher E over ET ratios, but there are a couple of deciduous forests that also have relatively high E over ET ratios consistently. Those are those sites that are still developing, right, where the canopy isn't quite closed. So we see differences amongst these different vegetation types. We see differences um, when it comes to leaf area indices of these different vegetation types. And when we gap fill these data, right, this is um, just uh, using um, our eddy proc. Uh, we can make annual sums, or sorry, seasonal sums of evapotranspiration, transpiration and evaporation of, for example, a pine site here. And I want to point out a couple key things, okay? There's an aspen site that has slightly higher evapotranspiration, perhaps, perhaps within the range of uncertainty, a little bit higher transpiration. You see similar seasonal courses, and so this is Victoria's insight is that it's not the E over ET ratio that's constant over time, that's changing quite dramatically, but daily evaporation is approximately constant across many of these sites, about a millimeter a day. It's relatively insensitive to this dramatic seasonality where you have leaves falling off trees and you know coniferous forests beginning to um, not transpire, because as you have lower and lower values of radiation okay you get and you get lower and lower transpiration but as the leaves begin to fall off the canopy a lower leaf area index that favors evaporation such that evaporation can be approximated as a constant one or 1.5 millimeters per day pretty consistently throughout time which is interesting of course this doesn't always hold but despite the vegetation type it seems to be a reasonable assumption and we're still looking more at the data so going forward, and I have about a minute left, I think, uh, there is a lot of work we still need to do. Okay, we need to validate all these approaches, including satellite approaches. We should save our high frequency eddy covariance data in order to run it through Fluxpart and see what it says about um, transpiration and evaporation, right? The algorithm doesn't always converge, but it, I think it gives fantastic results very frequently that we can learn a lot from in addition to the other partitioning approaches as well. We need to, of course, always better understand energy balance closure, and we need to keep on working together with people of different disciplines who have different level areas of expertise to continue to figure out our changing water cycle. So that's all I had for everybody today, and thank you again for your time and attention and for the invitation. All right, thank you, Paul, very much for that talk. We have time say for one question and then we'll move on to Matthias. So please, um, you can put your questions in the chat. I'll read them out. You can also use the Slack channels that we have um, set aside for this to continue on side conversations. Um, but if anybody has a question for Paul, please write them. No, I'll get on uh, Slack. I, oh, what was that, Paul? I was saying I need to register for the Slack channel. <laughs> We can, uh, Trevor sent that link out recently. We, we can keep sending it out. Um, yeah, I guess so, Paul, I'll, I'll start um, one question uh, quickly. So you mentioned so many different measurement techniques and possibilities, and I don't know if it's possible for you to pick sort of the most critical one to focus on going forward or the suite of critical things, you know, maybe that we aren't doing now that we need to focus on or that have proven to be most useful. I, uh, that's a really good question, and it's a great question because I don't have a good answer. I mean, I, I, there's benefits and disadvantages to all of these approaches, 
And I don't really think that everybody or anybody has done a very comprehensive bake off of multiple different approaches, especially when um, validated against observations. And um, there's, there's been some approaches where people have to extremely good effects used um, uh, large entity simulation in a modeling space to tell a system what transpiration and evaporation is and see if things like um, like flux variant similarity theory actually match what the computer already knows. And it doesn't always do so. So there's still some developments to be done when it comes to the basics of these approaches, uncertainties in all these measurements. And it would be nice, I guess this is something that we're arguing is that it would be wonderful to have an extremely comprehensive ecosystem scale study where we're measuring everything. We have relatively high confidence in all of these fluxes to see which relatively simple partitioning approach given the complexities of ecosystems matches best the patterns. And if it is in fact that, you know, multiple methods is the best way to go. So yeah, excellent question and thanks for asking it. I wish I had an answer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's see, so I'll ask one of the questions here from the chat. So Rahul Kashyap asks you, what is the key climatic factor affecting ET and water use efficiency? Oh, the key climatic factor, I mean, it changes over the, um, as a function of time scale. So over relatively short time scales, we have radiation and we have vapor pressure deficit. Um, and then over sort of weekly, depending on where you are in the world time scale, so moisture become, begins to become extremely important. And then over seasonal time scales, we have things like leaf area index and temperature dominating. So the controls are a function of temporal scale. And this sometimes leads to some confusion because the things that emerge become important over longer time scales, like temperature and leaf area index, um, over shorter time scales, especially the ferry index doesn't really vary yet at the same time in the growing season in the temperate zone, right? The ferry index is all about the same, yet T over ET can change dynamically depending on the hydrologic situation and the radiant environment. So um, it's a question that has an answer, and the answer is a function of scale. Um, and yeah, I think that that also is the cause of some confusion when it, some pa published papers are discussing about or thing like soil moisture or temperature or leaf area index being dominant when really there's this sort of hierarchical and cascading effects where a lot of things are important. Um, I'd like to point out also Kim Novick's paper showing that vapor pressure deficit is certainly increasing yet there's no model consensus as if soil moisture will increase or not. So there's reason to believe that we need to not exclude you know, one climatic or hydrologic variable at the expense of others when understanding how these systems are changing. Um, and I guess that really relates a little bit to Ali's question too. So the approaches that I talked about are those that can be measured using any covariance and the scale is going to be a function of how high your instruments are and a function of the flux footprint, um, which is a function, of course, of things like the sensible heat flux uh, and the wind speed, especially the friction velocity. Um, and yeah, actually, Ali, uh, there's scintillometry and microwave scintillometry to measure about the transpiration and sensible heat flux too. So more watershed regional scale analyses, I think would be very forthcoming. Um, and then to answer Sam's question, uh, particularly useful, I mean, leaf ferry index data is always extremely useful because at longer time scales, that's been consistently found to be one of the best descriptors of the T over ET ratio. And many studies have found this. Therefore, plant phenology is also important because leaf area index changes. Um, and yeah, the thing about vapor pressure deficit, if there's no moisture in the soil in the first place, of course, VPD doesn't matter. So that's, at some point there is some hierarchical control over the supply of water in the soil versus the demand in the atmosphere. And balancing that supply and demand is what plants are trying to do. Uh, you know, at the same time, right, we like to say, oh, DPD is the most important control, so moisture is the import most important control, but the answer is that they interact, and we can't really study one in the absence of another. Okay, so, um, yeah, is that yeah, good I think for that's, questions? That's okay. great, Paul, yeah, and so feel free to continue answering people's questions in the chat, and we can send out the Slack link again, um, and we should move on to Matthias now. Yeah. So so our next speaker is Matthias. He is from the Technical University of Dresden. 
and he's going to be talking about the question of how well can we quantify evapotranspiration. So take it away, Matthias. All right, I'm going to share my screen. Can you see it? The yes, presentation? And you hear me also, since you were able to answer my first question? That's very good. Uh, yep, we can. Okay. Yep. Here you go. So thanks very much also from me uh, for this invitation. It's a pleasure to be with you guys here um, who are all interested in evapotranspiration as me. Um, so my title is How Well Can We Quantify Evapotranspiration? And I should perhaps better say how accurately can we quantify um, evapotranspiration because that's the big question. Um, and most of the results that I will show are published already in this paper, which is um, available as a preprint and currently still under review, but you can have a look and, and read the details if you're interested later. I just started here um, at Technical University of Dresden. I did most of my work um, until September, actually, um, at the uh, Castle Institute of Technology and uh, with, together with my team and a lot of collaborators from different institutions and the funding was provided by the Helmholtz Association, one of the large uh, research associations in Germany and the DFG, which is kind of the equivalent of NSF in Germany. So what is the motivation of our studies? We typically um, in Fluxnet, uh, at many stations around the world, we set up towers in an ecosystem. We know there is a footprint function um, that relates the surface flux to the measurement at a certain tower. But in principle, it's very easy. You set up a sonic anemometer and a an gas analyzer, and you can measure the flux of a quantity, whatever it is, CO2, is what we're mostly interested in, in flux net, but also, of course, water vapor fluxes. So this is how we typically um, measure evapotranspiration, and that's the direct, most direct method actually to determine evapotranspiration on the ecosystem scale. You always have to say which scale you're measuring at. That was a good question also in the after pause talk. Um, but is this actually accurate? If this is what we call the most direct method, is this also accurate? Um, well, there's one way to test this, um, we can set up the energy balance. Uh, we use the energy balance equation and can compare the available energy at the surface, which is basically the sum of net radiation and the ground heat flux and plot it against uh, the sum of the turbulent fluxes. This is a figure from a paper by Paul Stoy and myself and a lot of other contributors because we had something like 170 sites uh, from flux Fluxnet from all around the world in the, uh, combined in that study and looked at energy balance closure and you see there is a systematic problem. Um, overall, not for every site and not for every site year for sure, uh, but overall there is a systematic underestimation of the turbulent fluxes, um, which can also of course mean that we systematically underestimate the latent heat flux, so evapotranspiration. Yeah, so this is an indication, but not a solution. Um, well, to find a solution, um, there have been several adjustment methods proposed because we know that that can be not be correct. Of course, uh, the available energy measurements have to be correct also. That is one assumption, but um, they cannot be that wrong at all the different sites. I think that has been clear now, at least after a lot of decades of research. This problem has been known not only since 2013, but uh, yeah, I think was first published in the 1980s already. But different solutions have been proposed. And one um, hypothesis uh, for the systematic underestimation is there is the presence of large scale transport. So usually we assume we have eddies that have roughly at maximum the size um, of the measurement height and, and a lot smaller, there's this turbulence energy cascade. So all these eddies transport water vapor and other substances, also energy uh, from the surface into the boundary layer, but there can actually be much larger circulations that fill the entire boundary layer. So on the scale of kilometers, 
uh, or of lead, uh, at least of one kilometer, and they can inherently not really be measured by such a small tower, as you can imagine. So what can we do? Um, we can construct a kind of a virtual control volume um, around our tower. It's a little bit more complicated now than the slide in the beginning. We still have this covariance at a measurement height at M that needs to be measured. Uh, then there is a storage term in this volume. Since we have a three-dimensional system and not a two-dimensional surface anymore, and then there can be fluxes in and out of this control volume, in and out of this box. There can be horizontal terms. These are indicated here with red arrow, arrows, uh, horizontal advection and horizontal flux divergence, and there can also be vertical advection. People have tried to measure these to get the fluxes right in the end, but um, I would say. Um, and please don't understand me, but with uh, misunderstand me, but with I would say with limited success. Um, so what do we do about it? Um, and our idea was um, one method that Paul already mentioned, we need to do um, large eddy simulations, the abbreviation is LES. So we have a model that can actually simulate physically based turbulence in a very fine grid. It's much finer than shown here, usually um, on the order of meters, and it has to cover the entire boundary layer, this uh, model grid. So it has to be at least uh, two or three kilometers in the vertical and several kilometers in the horizontal extent so that these large scale structures actually fit in. And then we can do virtual measurements inside this um, simulation domain. So, there has been studies that show that these large scale fluxes, they depend on stability. So we've done a set of simulations um, with different stability regimes near neutral here in the top left and very convective conditions here in the bottom right. And a lot of other cases in between. Um, this is showing the standard deviation of the U component uh, but uh, you could do this also with temperature. In any case, you see structures here um, that are typically larger than the small scale turbulent eddies that, that we assume are carrying the, the entire transport. And this is averaged over um, half an hour. So these structures are still there, um, even if you average longer uh, than half an hour. From this set of large eddy simulations, we can then derive parametrization that describes the underestimation of these virtual tower measurements because we know the fluxes in this model domain. That's the nice thing. We know the fluxes at the surface because we prescribe them. Um, and then we, we see what reaches this virtual measurement tower. And it, we see it depends on the measurement height that is shown here in the left figures, the left two figures. Um, and um, this is a probability distribution for the entire domain. And you see that for 10 meters, the energy balance closure is still relatively good, something like 90% on average. There's the median and the average. These are these uh, dotted and dashed lines. And then the imbalance, what well, that's called here, the scale sensible heat flux that is decreasing with or the imbalance is increasing, the scale sensible heat flux is uh, decreasing with height. And also the spread of this distribution gets larger. Same is happening, not identically the same, but similar things are happening for the latent heat flux. That's what we are most interested in in this workshop, um, but both are important to be considered. And then there is not only this dependence on the measurement height, but uh, another dependence on the stability before on the figure before I showed you stability as a function of set i over l. Uh, so the boundary layer height above over the book of length here is u star over w star, the friction velocity over the Dierdorf convective velocity scale. Um, and you see there's actually a relationship that you can fit here and it is different for the latent heat flux and the sensible heat flux. Yeah. There's a large, relatively large region of um, yeah, moderate convective stratification uh, where we have more or less no dependence on stability. And then for um, stratification 
close to free convection, but not quite, it suddenly increases and we have much larger imbalance that is connected to different shapes of these structures. Here they're more row-like and here they're more cell-like, cellular hexagonal structures, and they cause a larger imbalance. So you can fit these kind of functions here that are called F1 and F2. Um, there's a paper about it that you can read. And then we actually want to apply these functions that are purely um, derived based on LES. Now we want to see how it works in reality when we um, apply it for real world sites. And we compare this process oriented method based on large eddy simulations with three other methods uh, that have been proposed in the literature. One is bone ratio preserving, one attributes the entire residual to the sensible heat flux, and one attributes a larger portion of the residual to the sensible heat flux, but not the entire sensible heat flux. And then um, we can compare these fluxes um, with paired lysimeter measurements. And for one side, which helps us really um, to see whether the ET measurements or ET measurements are uh, estimates are correct. And of course, we can also check whether the energy balance closure improves. So we do this for three different sites here in this study. There's two grassland sites with differently complex terrain in the surrounding, but the sites themselves are flat and have relatively short grass most of the time because they're cut quite often. Um, this is in southern Germany near the Alps. Um, and then here we have the, the benefit of the lysimeters that are placed next to these eddy covariant sites, um, quite large and the uh, lysimeters and um, a quite, quite a large number of lysimeters also. Um, and then we can also do this for a forested site. Um, this is in Denmark and flat terrain, but with typically uh, typical Central European patchy land cover with urban, not urban, but little vill villages and uh, forested areas and agricultural areas. We also did a footprint analysis for this um, site in Denmark because if you look at energy balance closure, you have to make sure that the footprint is actually more or less homogeneous. Otherwise it doesn't really make sense uh, to compare available energy that's measured locally with the eddy covariance flux. So this is the probability distribution. And we see that for um, really most of the cases, we have more than 70% um, flux coming from that beach ecosystem there. Now I come to the results. Um, these are the dispersive fluxes that have been modeled or yeah, modeled by this um, parametrization that's based on large eddy simulation. They're called dispersive fluxes because they actually um, produce a covariance in space rather than in time or both actually space and time. So they're kind of spread out due to the scale of these large circulations. Um, and we compare it with the measured energy balance residual here for the different seasons. And you see um, at least the magnitude is roughly OK. Um, in fall, we have less dispersive fluxes. And we also see that the measured residual of the en energy balance is lower. So this is also kind of consistent. Um, but what you can also see is that the model doesn't show the entire variability. It shows the diurnal cycle, but um, the blue area is much larger than the red area. Now, these are the typical eddy, um, energy balance closure plots. Um, for this site in Denmark, the beach forest site in Denmark. So what you have to be aware is that the energy balance closure is actually quite good already for this site. We have a slope of this regression line um, of 0.92. So it's not too far away from one. Um, there is a little bit of spread that's also normal. That would probably be mostly due to some random error. But what we are here interested in is the systematic error, mostly 
the systematic bias of um, turbulent flux measurements. Um, so this is the purely measured energy balance closure. And when we apply the correction that is based on large eddy simulations only and not fitted in any ways to this site, um, we get a better closure. It's not ideal, but it is definitely better. The slope is close to one. Um, the intercept is yeah, not much different. And what's also interesting, uh, the Pearson's R is also quite the same. So it doesn't add any additional um, random uncertainty to, to the data, this correction, that's also important. We did the same for the grassland sites. Um, the energy balance closure for so those sites was much poorer to begin with. Here on the left-hand side for one year, 2014, with a slope of 0.76. And after applying the correction, um, it's close to unity and the Pearson's R uh, is also improving. So it not only the systematic, but even the random error could uh, be improved by applying this correction to the grassland side. And now we come to the comparison with the lysimeter for this site. For the forest, we didn't have the lysimeter, obviously. Um, and we compared it, this new method here in the bottom right with the three other methods, while the first one here in the top left corner doesn't apply any correction because it attributes the entire residual to the sensible heat flux. This is a bone ratio preserving method, which slightly overestimates um, the ET after applying the correction. And this is the method that is um, putting a larger portion of the residual into the sense of a heat flux, but not the entire um, residual. And here we get definitely on average a better closure, but there's also a large spread that is added to this data set, which wasn't there before really. So the Pearson's R is getting lower through this correction. Um, also the RMSE and the bias um, is improving. So this looks good, I would say. And now I didn't think it would work really for this grass fang site um, because it has mountains around it um, that are on the order of one kilometer. Uh, so highly complex terrain and uh, also circulations uh, that probably occur there, mountain valley systems. But nevertheless, by applying this correction, we get a much better closure. Um, again, improving also Pearson's R coefficient. And when we compare it to lysimeter nearby, um, also this method here in the top, uh, in the bottom right corner, the new method um, is leading to a better agreement with the lysimeter than the other three different variants of how to correct um, eddy covariance based ET measurements. So to summarize um, this first application of the new process based correction method that's based on large eddy simulations, ideally and actually homogeneous surface in this large eddy simulations. I didn't really think that, I expect that, that it would work so well, but it was quite promising. We applied it uh, to tall and low vegetation um, and different measurement heights also, both the magnitude, uh, the overall magnitude of the imbalance and the partitioning of the residual that could be checked um, with the lysimeter measurements were better predicted when, than with other correction methods on average. Um, one important input variable for this new method is the measurement, uh, is the boundary layer height set I. Um, we modeled that for the flat side because we didn't have any measurements there, and but it seems to be fine to do this just by modeling. And for the complex terrain side, it is certainly necessary to measure um, the boundary layer height, and that was based on light um, continuous LIDAR measurements that we do there since 2012. But then it also works, it seems, at least better than the other methods that have been published in the literature before. Nevertheless, and I um, invite you all to do this, further validation of this new correction model is needed for other sites uh, everywhere, ideally. 
We also want to do this for the GSAT data. This hasn't been done yet, but my PhD student, uh, Louise Ivana, is actually currently in Wisconsin and um, doing this together with colleagues um, of Anchor Desai's lab. And um, what we also want to do in the course of this GSAT project is include the effects of heterogeneity because we know they play a role. Although the homogeneous method already works quite okay, uh, we nevertheless hope that the performance of this method will even improve when we add heterogeneity into the equation. With that, I thank you for your attention and um, I'm happy to answer your questions.